Okay. So we're recording this. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over the virtual floor to you, Zenobia, um, to, to start your presentation. Thank you. Let me see if the screen sharing will go according to plan today. Um, let's see. Is this working for everyone? Okay, yep. great. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, on this series and uh, thank you very much Wynne for being here to uh, talk about this research. It's um, a little bit niche nuclear security so I'm going to try and make it as um, broadly relatable to everyone as possible and different applications in security studies and war studies and defense studies uh, of this research. Um, it's This is a, a compilation of probably the last four years worth of research. So there's a lot of different directions it goes in. Um, and I'll, I'll just uh, quickly walk you through that to start with, uh, how, how it came to be and why and where I hope it's going. Um, and then I'll talk you through sort of our latest paper and data. And uh, I'm really interested to see uh, when what you think about that and how I can be more clear in what I'm saying, because I'm good at sort of rambling in different directions, and also um, where, where I can take this next, how to make it into something a bit more uh, solid and big, maybe get some funding, something in that direction, um, basically bring it all together. Um, I could really uh, use your insight there. Uh, but yeah, to start with, um, for everyone who's wondering what I'm talking about, as Amanda said, I uh, work at King's organizing workshops on nuclear security. Um, and we're talking about the civil nuclear industry in a bunch of different countries here. So that's usually very typically a three day activity in a country like Saudi Arabia or South Africa. And we work with professionals who work at labs or power plants or universities um, or hospitals. And um, these are quite, uh, they can be introductory courses, they can be very in-depth. Uh, and the main thing we look at is uh, security culture. And my background isn't in uh, security. I trained as an archeologist, which means that maybe um, I observed some things that people hadn't considered when I started teaching these courses. And one of these things was how we were communicating and the language we were communicating in, uh, how this affected our teaching and um, how it had an impact on the learning of the people we were interacting with. Um, because for example, in South Africa, there's 11 official languages to start with and then dozens and dozens more unofficial languages. And then everyone comes together in a company and they all try to communicate in English. And that's a very typical thing in the nuclear field. There's the International Atomic Energy Agency, and they maintain a couple of official languages. Russian and Arabic are also on the list, but mostly all the official information is first and foremost communicated in English and the guidance is in English and people try to adapt to this as well. So if you're working in nuclear industry in Turkey, you read a lot of information in English, even if it's not your first language or the language you speak at work. So I became very interested in how does that impact security practices? Um, and uh, as you can see from the, the timeline and papers I created, we started by looking at um, security and education, but this has since evolved a little bit in uh, just generally, how do you access information and then what information is available in the first place? So we've sort of gone a little bit in the direction of um, intelligence and especially open source intelligence as well. Um, and what I'd really like to do with all of this is maybe, you know, get like some nice big postdoctoral funding or um, I'd be really interested in having a big edited book as well with examples from different countries and different cultures. I just don't really know um, how to get it off the ground <laughs> uh, combined with my other sort of research and projects at King's. Uh, I never seem to be able to focus it into something clear that someone will be interested in. Um, and especially at the moment, I'm actually on maternity leave, um, so I'm producing everything um, with one hand. And um, that's also why my slides today have a lot of text on them. It's mainly for me to remember what I'm talking about, um, because I'm not even sure what day and time it is right now. Um, but yeah, one of the things that I really wanted to 
highlight today in the discussion is um, just language diversity, because we, we have had a lot of discussions uh, in the nuclear field the last couple of years about um, other imbalances like gender imbalance. I've put a picture here of one of our workshops recently where we had 50 people attending and four of them were women. And that's with us already trying to make an effort. This was um, this is an example of failure, I'd say, rather than success. Um, but there's there's other um, imbalances as well, in my opinion, and one of them is language. So that's what I want to focus on now. The same workshop, the picture underneath, we had people from more than a dozen countries. Um, these were all Arabic-speaking countries, but not all Arabic is the same, which is um, something that's often assumed when you're producing international guidelines and information. Just use modern standard Arabic, everyone will get it. So that's something I'm really interested in looking into, um, how, how we can um, talk about nuclear security and make clear what it's about and avoid confusion and avoid miscommunication. Um, in different languages um, and investigates what's the role of English um, and when do we need to not to use English. Um, and that also uh, goes into um, the writing systems we use. So uh, a big, there's a big difference in um, Latin or Roman writing um, versus Arabic writing, or um, another one we've looked at is um, Korean, Japanese, Hindi, Chinese. Um, it, it just doesn't always directly um, translate the same way or mean the same thing when you go between languages, when you go between writing systems. And that can be difficult because very many nuclear projects have a lot of levels to them. It's not um, one academic department, you know, a power plant, they have engineers, they have managers, they have cleaners, they have drivers. You can't assume the same understanding and educational background for everyone. So why, why has language not really been on the agenda so far in how we work and how we teach? Um, because in a lot of other industries, it's already been acknowledged that that's really, really important to avoiding confusion, to avoiding safety, accidents, security incidents. Um, so this is something I'm interested in, just gathering some proper academic data on in nuclear context. Um, because every time I mention this to someone, the person on the other side will say, oh yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's probably relevant. Yes, I've had a problem with that before. But there's there's no uh, no data collection so far. There's no databases. Um, we know it's of interest, but we don't really know what we're doing. Um, I'm not sure I even talked about what was on this slide, but <laughs> anyway, the example I wanted to mention is um, aviation industry. It's another really high risk industrial sector, just like nuclear industry. And um, I think it's already 10 or 20 years ago, they developed an official aviation English. But even before that, the last century as aviation has been developing, um, it was acknowledged that everyone needs to be on the same language page because otherwise you get issues um, of the pilot calling the airport and um, people misunderstanding each other when you're going between so many different countries on a daily basis all the time. Um, there's different um, acronyms in different countries. There's um, just uh, different ways of expressing things. And that can be really important if you're you know, landing a plane and um, you need to circle back around. If you don't communicate that, clearly and directly straight away, um, there's, there can be big problems. And in aviation, there have been uh, direct examples of accidents happening because the communication wasn't clear. So I think this is a really useful industry to, to draw some comparisons from and to draw some data from. So there are misunderstandings, they can be a problem. Um, and there can be this, uh, yeah, this, this disconnect. So to illustrate uh, this in a nuclear field, I've been looking at the difference between safety and security as an example. Uh, this is a really um, quite well-known example if you're looking at uh, the field of linguistics. There's, there's a couple papers on just the safety security translation issue in general unrelated to nuclear. So that's what I've been working with as an example, but there, there can be lots of different ways to look at this. Um, 
But just to illustrate, I asked a couple of colleagues and friends from different countries, from uh, Bulgaria, from Japan, can you tell me um, how would you describe what safety is? How would you describe what security is? And it just has different connotations in different cultures. Um, for example, when I, I, I put some on the slide here, but when I talked to a friend in Turkey, they said safety, that's when you care for another person. Security, that's the police. So um, it, it can mean very different things to different people, also individually, not just the country and the language. And uh, in a lot of languages, it, there's not even two words for it. In most languages, there's just one word that means both safety and security. Um, and in a couple of languages, there's multiple words. So you specify, you know, food safety um, and uh, health safety. There's, those are different words and different concepts, um, which I'm trying to say in English now, it doesn't translate very well. So anyway, the point I'm making is uh, even if we were translating all of our teaching materials in nuclear security, and even if we were translating all the nice IAEA guides on um, fiscal protection and uh, important aspects of security at nuclear sites, um, the translation, it, it can't just be, you know, a, a Google Translate direct thing. You have to understand the context of the country you're, and the facility you're translating it for. Uh, so one of the projects I did the last year or two uh, was trying to see what information is there about nuclear security to start with. Um, and this is something I've worked on with uh, many colleagues, including some from King's College. Um, but particularly, uh, I worked with uh, someone from Turkey and uh, someone from Jordan and someone, well, from the US, but with knowledge of India, uh, to see what information is there anyway about nuclear security and is this accurate? If you're finding it, is this something that's been directly translated and does that make sense to you if you're reading it in a different language? And uh, if you're looking for it, what exactly will you end up with? Because a really unique thing about the nuclear field is that it's very uh, secretive, uh, necessarily so. And um, a lot of documents will be classified. So if you're working at a nuclear site, those things won't be online on the internet. Um, and that's necessary. However, if you are, for example, a student um, or you are someone who's looking to join the field or you're someone who's been working in the field but wants to um, switch jobs to a different country, uh, what information can you access that's not classified? Um, and that's something that we as researchers could look into because that's something that we can also access just to open sources on the internet. So we decided to explore that as aspect to see um, what information is there and is that useful? So uh, here's a first example of a case study we did on Turkey. Don't mind all the tiny, tiny print on the slide. Basically, what I want to illustrate is if you are doing a search in English for security or safety, um, almost all the sources you'll get will be about nuclear energy. So we typed into Google Advanced Search really specifically nuclear security, but then all the information you get are actually about nuclear energy. And nuclear security sort of came second as a category. Um, and also notably, um, all of it was related to the civil nuclear field and none of it to, um, for example, nuclear weapons or non-proliferation, even though uh, Turkey does have some involvement with that, uh, with NATO. So it's, it's quite, curated what's available on the internet. And then when we looked for nuclear safety, um, most things in Turkey came from the nuclear regulator, but there wasn't any other related information. There was some information about um, earthquake risk in Turkey, which is very specific to the region and environmental protest. Um, but again, the, the main sort of the bulk of the pages weren't necessarily nuclear safety themed. Um, it's just a word that might be mentioned somewhere at some point. And then we looked at um, what happens if you look for the same uh, for the same information in Turkish, um, and you can see it's still nuclear energy is the main category. But also, I think can I go back between slides here? Yeah, I can. <laughs> you can see there's actually less information, so there's there's fewer pages, there's fewer search results uh, in Turkish, and also there's fewer categories of information. So if you were 
someone who's working in the nuclear field in Turkey looking for information about nuclear security, you're better off looking for it in English than in Turkish. And also um, the graph I have on the right here is how accurate it was. So if we looked for nuclear security, does the web page actually talk about security or um, about something else, usually safety? And you can see that mostly it was accurate, but actually a fairly significant percentage of the searches um, were also inaccurate. I can't remember from the top of my head now, something like 10% or something of the information was not actually translated correctly or um, described correctly because of um, this confusion between what is safety, what is security. Um, as I said, this was just one example, safety and security. You can apply this to other concepts as well, like risk and threat is another really big one. Um, there's more of them. Uh, so uh, we looked at this in a couple of different countries. We looked in India as well. Uh, English is a really big language in India. And there's, there's many uh, languages there, um, but we, we compared it to Hindi for our own sort of ease for the, for the research for the search to start with. Um, I've got some information on other languages as well, but I won't go into that now. And uh, again, you can see the difference. There's um, more information in English than there is in Hindi. And also in Hindi, safety and security is the same word. So there was only one search there anyway. So all the categories combined in Hindi, there were fewer of them. Uh, but of course, if you look at the two separately, there's, there's more. And uh, again, we looked at what was accurate and what was inaccurate. And for India, this was much better. And we uh, suspect this is because there is also a, a better command of English, particularly in the nuclear field, which is um, usually uh, a lot of people who will put this information out on the internet will uh, be highly educated or they will be working on quite a high level as engineers or things like this. So. Um, they will have been educated in English, sometimes in England. Uh, so the information in India that was available in English um, was uh, a lot more high quality than it was in Turkey. Um, and then we also looked at Jordan. So Turkey, they've, uh, they're in the process of completing a nuclear power plant right now. Uh, India, they've had nuclear power for decades as well as nuclear weapons. Jordan, they don't have a nuclear power plant. They do have a nuclear research reactor. So that's what we would describe as really like a country that's very new to nuclear. So what's the, what's the information availability there? Is, there? is there anything? Is it useful? And again, you can see this difference between English and Arabic. There's much, much less in Arabic. And I haven't put the numbers in here, but we have something like only 30 or 40 search results in general of anything nuclear related in Arabic. Um, and there's much more in English, which I think is really interesting for a country that hasn't even sort of like developed anything nuclear yet. So already English is, is the dominant language there, not, not the own national language. And also much more of it was inaccurate because a lot of the Arabic information was a direct Google translate from English and then safety and security get mixed up and other concepts get mixed up. So uh, the inaccuracy of the information increased. Um, we did also have a little look at like, oh, what happens if you look at other countries in Arabic? So for example, United Arab Emirates, they've been operating a power plant for a couple of years now. Um, but there was actually fairly similar information availability or inavailability and inaccuracy to Jordan. Um, I just don't have the data on the slide here. So uh, that's, that's a couple of case studies we looked at. Um, and I think what's really important here is just this, this cultural aspect really goes missing when you're looking for information about uh, nuclear security. So on the left here is an image that a colleague of mine made for one of our uh, Zoom workshops last year. And she uh, decided to ask the audience in uh, colloquial Turkish about uh, how they felt about the security of, uh, of nuclear in Turkey. Um, so not using any of the, the professional terminology that we use in the workshop, um, but just uh, common expressions from Turkey. And this resulted, uh, one, in a lot more interaction in the workshop, but also, two, in just a better understanding. It's not so, um, it's not so abstract when you're talking about it with each other in that way. Um, and 
I think that's really important because yeah, you, you might express things differently depending on where you are and who you're talking to and to take that into your professional communication to make sure everything is clear and everything is understood. So um, just in, in summary of that, as I said, uh, in India, uh, a lot of information is available in English rather than Hindi or other languages. So it does make sense if you're focusing on um, what, what information to make available and how to do it to maybe do that in English. Um, but then for Turkey, uh, it, it's sort of the opposite where um, you might encourage people to, to learn English professionally, but you want to avoid confusion at any point. So um, at the moment, the power plant they're building, it's being sponsored by Russia. So they're having conversations between Russian and English and Turkish where no one has full command of any of the other two languages. Um, and it's, it's also not expected that all the Russians learn Turkish and all the Turkish personnel learn Russian. So um, you have to uh, take that into account when you're, you know, like us doing our teaching, but also pu publishing any information or um, when you are uh, onboarding new personnel, when you are looking at um, what students are doing in university right now, where that's going. And then uh, for Jordan, as I mentioned at the start, uh, the main issue we encountered there is that a lot of information is in modern standard Arabic and not necessarily um, regional. I've had conversations with colleagues in Egypt about this as well, where they say, oh, they've, the IAEA, when they do uh, use regional Arabic, it's usually um, sort of Levant Arabic and uh, not more than African Arabic. And uh, there's different ways in which things can be expressed that can be more clear to people um, in different regions. So just on a final note on that as well, as I said, this has gone a little bit from we were looking at nuclear language in uh, teaching and how it works in the workplace and whether there might be confusion, but then we went a little bit in the intelligence direction. So what information is available? Uh, what can you do with that? Um, is that is that useful or not and why and part of that is also uh, how and whether you can use the internet so as i said as researchers this was an easy way for us to start looking into nuclear language and nuclear information we can use open source um, and you know i'm based in the uk and one of my colleagues was based in the us and there's very high internet access and availability there um, uh, but then for Turkey, that's about 70%, for Jordan, 66 And then in India, if you look at the whole country, it's around 35%. Um, so that information availability, um, it might be there for me, but not for everyone else. And then on top of that, you have to take into account that's usually going to be available to people who um, are from a wealthier background. If you have a house and electricity and internet, so if you don't, how are you going to learn anything about nuclear? So let alone if you are someone who works in nuclear industry or studies uh, nuclear engineering, how will you know about your country's power plants or nuclear weapons if you can't even access any of the information or understand it properly? So um, that's, that's another sort of direction we've gone in with this research in uh, general nuclear awareness um, versus uh, information availability, information access. And I, we did have some useful suggestions in the end. So um, I'm sorry if it's not clear, but separating between suggestions for nuclear industry and suggestions for open source intelligence. For nuclear industry, uh, we, we do think it makes sense to match the education to specific context you're working in. And I, I realize that's not a very sort of novel um, conclusion, but you know, now we've tested it and now we've got some data. So it's not just people saying it from experience or hearing that, uh, we know for sure now. And um, we do also think that it's useful to keep in mind that sort of common language like aviation uses. So, I guess it doesn't have to be English in a lot of countries. In fact, it's Russian. I haven't even talked about that. Um, but to make sure that everyone has access to learning that language and understanding that language and that you can talk through it um, in native language versus the common language to make sure it's actually understood rather than just sort of imposed or applied, um, which 
you know, have leaves us with a question, um, should the IAEA also have this, you know, like aviation has aviation English, should we have nuclear English? Um, or should we put some more effort into, you know, translating the materials into different types of Arabic um, or both, who knows? Um, and then on sort of more the, the OSINT side of things, um, we did think that by looking at nuclear security as an example, um, we questioned uh, what openly available information is there anyway? Um, are online searches useful in, if you want to learn more about this? And the answer is not especially. Um, can you find information in languages that aren't English? Not really. Um, do things get mistranslated? Yes, they do. So not only if you're a person uh, who is working in the nuclear field or interested in joining the nuclear field, um, I lost my grammar there. Um, it's, it's not only important to those people, but also if you are, for example, trying to um, do some research on it, uh, like I do in academia, um, but perhaps also in other contexts, what sort of information can you really find from a country? And it's um, not only that it's um, shielded and secured, which is what the countries generally want, it's also what is there is actually um, not necessarily accurate, which can then give the wrong impression and um, lead to things like, um, what are the words, like disinformation, and um, it can actually mean that the information gets used in the wrong way, basically. So even if you want to uh, protect all your really sensitive information, it's important that what is available out there is actually correct and um, used in the right way and understood in the right way. Because nuclear is a pretty, pretty big thing to misunderstand um, geopolitically. So yeah, what I really want to say from the, the combined research is that um, I think it's useful to look at um, not just English when you're discussing nuclear security, um, not, not only in acquiring information, but also in publishing information. And um, to really clarify some key concepts in uh, different languages, um, because it does influence security practices and it does prevent uh, accidents. I think that was it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Zenobia. There's certainly a lot of food for thought there. And uh, I think what, you know, was made clear too is the, the serious risks involved in the, in the Lost in Translation. Um, yeah, lots to sink our teeth into for sure. I'm going to pass the virtual floor over to Wynn for uh, some of his um, general or more specific comments and commentary. Okay. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Zenobia, um, for your talk. And also, you sent me a couple of papers beforehand so I could have a, have a sort of more in-depth read looking at the research too. Um, so thank you for, for all of that. Um, it's a fascinating subject area, right? I mean, you, you, you make the point that it's quite niche, um, and it is quite niche, right? Because we're talking about, you know, some very narrow sort of subject matter. Um, but the importance of linguistics and linguistic differences I think is really really important not just in the nuclear security area but in security uh, in a much broader sense right they can get you into you know deep amount of trouble I mean you know you just think about you know um, the concept of deterrence for example in the nuclear area in a broader sort of sense uh, is, is quite it's quite complicated right when the Russians look you know the Russian view the, the French view there you know, that different uses of language and whether they actually have the right terms themselves so I think you've done a good job, I think, in the in the research demonstrating the importance of nuance in nuclear language, the miscommunication potential. Um, and I think through the through the three case studies, Turkey, India, Jordan, you've you've, I think, um, identified some important questions. So the, the, the research kind of comes up with questions. Well, should we be doing this and should we be doing that? Um, you know, uh, the question of is information accurate in a different language when it's sort of translated across? So I think some of the important points you make around in the paper, um, you know, about should we be matching education and training to specific information needs of nuclear power program, nuclear power programs, you know, for human resource development, for example, 
Um, you talk about you know nuclear English and whether that's we should be pursuing that, taking the lead from the aviation area. I think that's a really interesting and important question. Um, but you do make the point, you know, about this diversity aspect and the inclusion aspect. It's about you know do we need to look beyond these internationally dominant languages, right, and spend a lot of effort trying to make nuclear security related information accessible, you know, and so that it's published in different languages, etc. Although that obviously would take a it's quite a resource challenge there to be able to do that. Um, and you make the important point too that nuclear, the nuclear sector, whether it's military or civil uh, in nature, is very secretive, right? So that's a key underpinning factor here too, is that much, much nuclear security information for very good reason is not open and accessible as well. So, so a really interesting set, a couple of readings and, and enjoyed listening to you talk now. Um, I've got three main points, but before I do that, listening to you talk about this is a bit of a back to the future moment for me. So from 2001, 2006, you know, I worked with colleagues at King's on, on a lot of open source work, looking at nuclear safeguards issues rather than nuclear security issues. Um, nuclear safeguards, for those who, who don't know, the sort of the distinction is more is, is about um, making sure that countries that have civil nuclear programs don't transfer their their nuclear material into a weapons program. So it's safeguarding against that. And we did a lot of work at King's on that for, for, for many years. And we used to work in different languages, you know, so we, we did a lot of work in English, obviously, but we did a lot of work in local languages too, um, including Turkish actually, but um, also, you know, in Arabic and, and other, other local languages too uh, of interest. One of the things I remember there was that we used to do a lot of content comparison um, on National Atomic Energy Agency websites, so the National Authority. Um, we weren't looking at content comparison for accuracy, you know, in terms of the language, but just in terms of the, just the sort of the raw kind of content. Are they saying things in one language in more detail than they would be in English? And we were looking at that in terms of transparency issues. So looking at it in a different way, but it does make me sort of come back to this issue of, yeah, this is really important stuff, very, uh interesting stuff we used to do a lot of specialized searching too around much more granular terminology mostly in english you know related to parts of the uranium enrichment process for example um uh, be interesting to see whether we could you, you could do that in in uh by taking your approach right which is seeing whether or not you can develop you know a glossary of different of, of these very specific terms to use across different languages and, and what you get from that anyway I'll stop reminiscing. Um, so I've got, I've got three three general points to make. The, the first point, I think, um, is around the audience for the work, for, for the papers. Um, and I think across from reading the papers and listening to you today, um, there are various, various audiences for this work, right? There's researchers, there's nuclear operators, nuclear regulators, academics, Policymakers, nuclear security professionals, I think you mentioned journalists at one point in there too. And I think what would would be good going forward is to perhaps have a bit more clarity around the audience which this research is focused on. Um, clearly, these are really, really important issues. Absolutely. Um, totally get that. But sometimes I was asking the so what question, you know, the academic so what question. And yes, there's a so what there because we know it, but actually I think the clarity over the audience would help with that so what bit. So, and it will help with laying out objectives um, of, of, of the work too. So part of this might be working through, is the priority for the work you're doing nuclear security and making sure things don't happen? Or actually you're more interested in the inclusive bit to make sure that you know everybody has an opportunity to understand the issues involved so i think that's that's my that's my first general point my second point is about um is more of a pet issue i suppose a little bit is about um open source open source intelligence as a discipline um so as academics um all we do is deal with open source information uh, of one various type but most people in an academic sense, wouldn't label that as, as open source intelligence as such. So I struggle a little bit with the idea that open source intelligence is a discipline. I think it's a method to achieve an end, which is you have a research problem and you apply um, open source intelligence to, to that research problem. Um, 
I'm more comfortable with thinking of open source intelligence as something that's done in the private sector. Um, but I do understand too that, you know, it is something that, you know, when you've got very specific research problems, it is something that is done in academia too. Anyway, uh, that's one of my pet issues is like, you know, is this a real discipline by itself? Um, and then my final point, actually, no, it's not my final point. I got some more from listening to you talk. I've got more points. So my final sort of point that I've thought about before you started speaking, um, was around some of the examples that you use. And I think this is a real area to go forward with. Um, so you talk about the nuclear power plant being built in the UAE by the KEPCO from South Korea. And you talk about, you know, you know, two dozen country people from two dozen countries involved in the construction of that and the multiple scripts problem that generates. And I was wondering whether actually, you know, the UAE um, and, the, and, and South Koreans, are, are they quite open to have conversations actually uh, with people? I mean, I've, I've, I've had conversations with officials from both countries uh, on the nuclear side for different projects in the past. I'm wondering whether or not you could actually just approach them and just ask them about, right, okay, you know, is this a problem in that sort of practical hands-on sense? You know, it may not be a problem. So I think that could be one really interesting area to drill down going forward. And it's a general point too. I think one of the quotes in the paper you've got is real life case studies and practical solutions remain limited, right? And that's that's a challenge for a project like this. And I think it's how can you prize open those case studies, those examples that you can really drill down into. The other one, obviously you talked about the International Civil Aviation Organization and the lessons um, that came out of that. I'm wondering whether or not you could draw those lessons really specifically in the nuclear security area and potentially look at the lessons and just you could create some surveys, you could do some research interviews with practitioners in the nuclear security area to ask the same sort of questions to start generating a sense of well, a sense of what practitioners in the nuclear security area think think is is uh, whether there's sort of read across or, or not. And that could then in itself help to generate research questions and ideas that you could then you could then look at. So I think, you know, if this was my project, what, I, what I'd be thinking about doing is like the next step for me would be trying to understand whether there have been incidents or accidents related to nuclear security where language has been a problem because of linguistic differences and the various other things that you identified. I know that's difficult because companies and governments sometimes don't like to talk about where there have been problems. But I think that would be so valuable if you could try to see whether that has been uh, an issue. So I guess, I guess field work. Um, I'll finish off by, you talked about funding, uh, you know, as, as an area to, 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 to discuss. I think, I go back to my point, I think it may be worthwhile doing some field work, some interviewing, in a light sense, just to start to pull together some re interesting research questions and go from there. Um, I think you could make a case for, you know, looking at the civil aviation or, or authority organization and looking at the read across there, if that hasn't been done properly before, because I think that's a really interesting area. Um, and I mentioned the KEPCO one in, in South Korea too. The final thing I'd say is, and this is, I say to, to most academics, um, you mentioned an audio, an edited book. Um, and the first thing I thought, why an edited book? Why not a authored or co-authored book? It's much better for you in terms of academic progression to have, you know, authored or co-authored books against, against your name. Um, you know, I'd be interested in hearing what other case studies you might think about looking at, you know, beyond the three that you've worked with colleagues on so far. And then also just then going back to that, the audience of that book, who would that book be, who would that book be targeted at? And so I'll stop there. I've talked for too long, but um, fascinating area. Really enjoyed reading the papers and listening to you talk. So I hope those comments have been vaguely useful. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think your first comment uh, on who, who the audience is, is that's very helpful um, because it started out as the audience is the people we teach in the workshop. So nuclear operators and regulators. Um, but I do think I will try and like explain myself better in that looking at inclusion will then lead to improving security. I think um, the two are connected is what we uh, sort of realized along the way. Um, so when, 
when everyone at the the organization we're working with is included in the communication then you can prevent uh, security incidents uh, so inclusion leads to security um, but yeah the, the main audience to start with was was the audience from the workshops um, I also agree that um, I'm, I'm also a little bit new to OSINT as a discipline which is why I, I titled my presentation information rather than uh, open source intelligence because I, I do see it as uh, working with information in different ways as a researcher so um, yeah I get that one and um, let me see. Yeah, so about um, working with, for example, aviation, uh, I got the idea because someone was already doing that. So I attended a presentation at INMM one time uh, where some researchers had been looking at the comparison between nuclear industry and aviation. Um, so I don't want to steal that from them, but also it's not actually published anywhere. So um, the next step there is to maybe get in touch with them and see where that's at. Um, and then about uh, doing some field work, that's exactly what I've been trying to do the last sort of two years. Um, but I, uh, my funding applications keep getting rejected. And then on top of that, um, we got COVID pandemic. So I had two auto rejections last year where they just said, we won't consider it because you can't travel anyway. Um, and a lot of the interesting things are kind of tied to being on site uh, in how comfortable people are talking, um, but also uh, access to people in general, like um, the site we work with in South Africa, a lot of people, uh, I wouldn't be able to Zoom them. So it, it is a little bit field work dependent, which is a little bit funding dependent. Um, I just need to make my argument better, I suppose. <laughs> um, and which the same goes for collecting some examples of um, nuclear incidents related to language. I have a strong feeling they are there because we look at nuclear security so much and uh, nuclear security culture and culture um, ties in with communication. So a lot of the security culture examples we have of accidents in the past uh, are related to how people communicate, just not necessarily um, how it's translated. So that's the next thing that I'd really like to get some details on. Um, but it's difficult to get people to open up about that, understandably. Um, and the, the other region I'm really interested in looking at uh, for case studies is um, countries that use Russian as a language rather than English. So I've been working with a colleague from Belarus on, on a paper for this, um, for the IAA conference in Moscow this summer, but um, it's been quite difficult to get uh, people from other countries involved. So I'd really like to work with someone from Ukraine, um, maybe also any uh, country in Central Asia that uses Russian. Uh, to develop some case studies that aren't completely centered around English, um, because I do have some data from colleagues in Belarus, Belarus and Ukraine that um, they have some issues translating directly between Russian and their own languages. And then issues translating between Russian and their own language and English as well. So I think that's another really interesting direction to go in. Um, I've also talked to um, colleagues in uh, South America about um, English versus Spanish versus Portuguese and other local languages. Um, and I've, I've even had a colleague from uh, Canada bring up um, not just the difference between English and French, um, but they are concerned that there's no information about anything nuclear for uh, any uh, anyone who doesn't speak English and French in Canada. So that's very niche, but still uh, to me very interesting. Um, and then, yeah, the, the last point you made about a book is everyone tells me that I should author my own book um, for academic purposes. It's just, um, I guess I'm, I'm not as academic at heart um, and I'm more interested in, in, the, in the nuclear industry side of things. So I'd really like to showcase different examples from different people uh, from different countries and gather them together and also a little bit give them more of a platform and not have another a uh, book written by someone in the UK uh, about this, but really um, have some, some chapters from people from different countries and from different organizations. Um, so that's not so good for me, um, but my, my interest there really is sort of the diversity in the field. <laughs> um, but maybe, you know, maybe what I need to do is both. Okay, no, that's, that's, that's excellent responses there, uh, Zenobia. I think on the, um, with the research grants, I, I wonder whether you need to convince somebody up your 
chain of command in uh, in Kings to give you some seed seed funding to do some initial feed work because I think sometimes you need to do a little bit of field work to be able to put together um, strong research applications, grant applications, because it just gives that granularity to it. You know, if you can demonstrate through conversations already that there's a research problem here, and here's the evidence for it, we just need to dig into that, and that's why I was why I need the funding. So. Um, Perhaps go to uh, I don't know uh, suggest names, but perhaps someone will give you some seed money to do that. Um, I mean, al along that note too, Zenobia. I think, I guess it depends how you frame the question or you know um, the the intent to evoke some sort of conversation. But I was actually quite surprised at what people talk about over Zoom now, and I don't know if we've just all got kind of interested or used to Zoom over the last two years, but. Um, you know, I have, I have a colleague who's working on issues of sexual based gender violence, which is a very sensitive topic and she's been able to conduct interviews with perpetrators of the violence and victims as well over zoom. And they uh, feel comfortable having those conversations which normally you would think you could not have that conversation satellite. Um, so I don't know if this is changing now because again, people are getting used to more of a virtual space. Uh, you know, additionally, someone you might want to talk to is Claudia Aradow with her um, massive EU grant on um, migrants crossing the border, which is also a very politically sensitive discussion where she's actually interviewing migrants um, and they've developed certain um, interview strategies because of COVID, they couldn't go face to face, but how they could have certain conversations while still protecting these people's identity. So I think there is some strategies out there. And if it's just about, you know, establishing some some sort of uh, basis for a problem for then which to apply, you know, to, to talk to um, people further up the chain at Kings or for the grant money, if you can at least demonstrate, like Wynne said, there, there, there's a problem here. So it, that just might be something not to totally foreclose because I, I get that. I, I felt that way too. There's certain conversations you can't have online, but now apparently there are conversations you can have online. So it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's fielding that out. Um, those, that's, that's my two cents on research field work and the virtual space. Um, we have a question here um, by uh, Santiago Sandra, who says, hi, everyone. Is there any written resource like a dictionary or glossary about nuclear security where anyone could search a specific word? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, the IAEA does have a nuclear security glossary, an official one uh, in I think five or six languages and a lot of countries will have their own unofficial ones as well. Um, the issue I have with those is that they're uh, usually uh, yeah, literally like a, a, a list of translations, what's the word for that, rather than explaining why something is translated in that way. So the IAEA glossary for Russian has a couple of translators notes and also the one for Spanish, I think, saying uh, we decided to explain this in this way for these reasons, or this is um, just an addition to what this means after you've translated it. But they've done that for maybe six words or something. Um, so uh, there are translations, but you just have to trust that you understand them and that they are right. So they're, they're not um, very sort of practically useful translations. And also, yeah, the IEA only officially does it for a couple of languages. Um, so for example, Turkish doesn't have one. Okay, great. And then we had someone in the chat box. Um, oh, same word, Santiago just says, you know, greetings from Argentina. So you have a global audience here, Zenobia. <laughs> and says really great presentation. So, yeah, I mean, this is so much food for thought and I can't wait to see how this, um, you know, how, how you're thinking around this and what sort of um, um, projects um, derive from this, that, you know, taking this forward. I, I look forward to continuing these conversations with you, Zenobia, for sure. Um, and again, want to thank you and Wynne so much for taking the time out of your day, um, for you coming off leave, Zenobia, for, for um, having this conversation uh, with us. So, and thank you so much for the audience for, you know, for listening in and engaging with, um, with this work. So those are my final comments. I don't know if Zenobia and Wynne, if you have anything else let, you'd like to say. 
no, just thank you for uh, for inviting me for this and uh, for having a listen to my research. Um, it's been really interesting, so thank you. Okay, great. And for those of you who still want to learn more about Zenobia's work, she will have a blog post coming out with critical military studies in due course. So please um, watch out for that. And this um, presentation has also been recorded. So if you've missed some of it, or if you want to watch it again, or circulate it amongst um, your networks, um, please watch this space. It'll be on War Studies YouTube channel, but also circulate it um, through the, the School of Security Studies um, Twitter and Facebook handles. Gwen, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Nobia. Thanks, Amanda.